welcome back to the Dirt Diaries Explorers, especially those who are lounging in the villa, taking notes in the library, or snooping in the restricted section. Well, we're back again, and we're taking another left turn. And while we covered the craziness of Hobby Lobby and their multiple art scandals, we're now moving a hop, skip, and a jump over to talk about death. But not just regular death, no. We're talking about the funerary texts of ancient Egypt. And while many of you might be like, yeah, huh, the Book of the Dead, it slaps. And yes, it absolutely does. But we're also looking at the texts that came from before the Book of the Dead. And the Book of the Dead, of course, was recently in the news for discoveries of it on papyrus. There was, of course, also the recent exhibition on it at the Getty Villa and played a massive role in the 1999 cinematic classic, The Mummy. So it's safe to say I've wanted to dive into this topic for quite some time because it's been at the forefront of my mind. And of course, with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice coming out soon, we, in a sense, are talking about ancient handbooks for the recently deceased. But before we head into the realm of death, funerary texts, and ancient handbooks, we have some housekeeping. Don't forget to join Patreon where there is extra content for all of you history lovers out there. The villa is great for those looking for extra bite-sized history videos for you to soak up extra knowledge, you know, to answer any of those odd trivia or Jeopardy questions should they come up. Recent videos that I've dove into include Omen texts becoming deciphered from the British Museum and smashed Osiris statues, and of course, plenty more. The library is perfect for those looking for ad-free and early access to podcasts and extra content from me. The Who's Who of World Mythology is out now for the month, and we dove into the mythology about Osiris. And sprinkled in to this little video, actually has some bits of my own research concerning the one relief that now exists only in a drawing, which is in my dissertation. So super, super excited to have covered that. And last but certainly not least, there is a restricted section for those who love archaeology and ancient history as much as I do where you get bonus episodes, bibliographies for further reading, book reviews, and more. Research and resources are up for our Osiris video, and this month's deep dive will be coming out next week on Nazi looted artwork. And if you want to be part of the Dirt Diaries Restricted Book Club, I, of course, am breaking down the first half of Dr. Kara Cooney's When Women Ruled the World, so please join us over on Patreon. And the Egypt 2.0 trip is out now, and this will be happening from April 2nd to the 10th of 2025, which is absolutely insane to think about that next year is one just around the corner and two already 2025. We're seeing more tombs, more temples, and King Tut. Yes, this trip is going to three cities, Cairo, Aswan, and Luxor. Some new additions to this trip that separates the April trip from the September trip is overnight river sailing on the Nile, the Filey Temple Complex, where the last hieroglyphics were said to have been etched into the walls, and new tombs in the Valley of the Kings, such as Seti I and Ramses V and VI, since they, spoiler alert, they share a tomb. And of course, King Tut's tomb. We are still going to be seeing major things in Egypt because it wouldn't be ancient Egypt without the Pyramids of Giza, the Temple Complex at Karnak, and Hatshepsut's Mortuary Temple. So check everything out about this trip in the show notes of this episode if you are interested. Makes a great birthday, early Christmas gift, or even a treat yourself gift as you travel Egypt with me, an archaeologist and an art historian. And since we are on the aspect of Egypt, I am leaving you guys in two weeks for the September Egypt trip. So I'm super, super excited to be hanging out with all the Dirt Diary fans, those who love Sticks and Bones podcast. I'm super excited to be hanging out with all of you. And the last thing on the list for, you know, putting books away for housekeeping is to remember that the Friday before the newest episode of the Dirt Diaries podcast, I launch Friday Finds on YouTube, where I break down some of my favorite archaeological discoveries from the previous two weeks. This most recent one covered the new Scylla statue heads, of course, from Greek mythology, the now world's oldest calendar at the site of Golbeki Tepe in modern Turkey, which is believed to be almost 13,000 years old, and the new discoveries coming out of the site of Pompeii. And with that being said, all the books are put away, so let's go ahead and dive into the funerary texts. So as I said earlier, the Book of the Dead is not the only funerary text. We're, of course, going to cover that one, but we have to travel back in time to the Old Kingdom prior to the Book of the Dead. That's right, we're starting with the Pyramid texts. And to do this, 
we have to put ourselves in this mindset. So we're in ancient Egypt. And unfortunately, we just died. Very, very sad. But what comes next after death? Well, if we were rich, of course, mummification. But that will be on its own episode of Dirt Diaries. But after our mummification, what would we get funerary text-wise? How would we get to the afterlife? Well, the pyramid text would be our guide. And pick a time, because we died during the Old Kingdom, which is roughly 2686 through 2181 BCE. But the pyramid texts only appear at the end of the Old Kingdom, and they've been found in the tombs of 11 kings and queens at the site of Saqqara, which is the capital city of Memphis. The tombs where the pyramid texts have been found are from Unis of Dynasty 5, from Teddy, Dynasty 6, Pepi I, Dynasty 6, Ankenis Pepi II, Dynasty 6, Benehu, who is wife of either Pepi I or Pepi II, Moranre, Dynasty 6, Pepi II, Dynasty 6, Neith, a wife of Pepi II, Input II, another wife of Pepi II, Wejebti, wife of Pepi II, and Ibi, who was Dynasty 8, which technically does fall under the first intermediate period of Egyptian chronology. Here, the interior walls of ancient tombs were inscribed with a series of ritual and magic spells known today in modern scholarship as the Pyramid Texts. Copies of the Pyramid Texts from this point onward were also inscribed on tombs, sarcophagi, coffins, canopic chests, papyri, stella, and other funerary monuments of non-royal Egyptians. Now, if these were being placed in our tomb, they would be inscribed mostly in vertical columns on the interior walls of each pyramid. They are divided into spells, units of varying length, from a few words to several hundred, each usually preceded by a monogram for the direction of the recitation, and marked at the end by a sign taken from the hieroglyph for chapter or section. Pyramid texts are of two kinds, ritual and personal. The spells that address the deceased in the second person are ritual in nature, originally recited by a lector priest in the role of the deceased son during the rites that probably took place at the funeral. These were carved on the walls of the pyramid chambers to ensure their ongoing effectiveness. The pyramid texts also contain two major groups of such spells, the offering and the insignia rituals, and the resurrection ritual. The offering and insignia rituals are always associated with the north wall of the burial chamber. The offering ritual accompanied preparations for and the presentation of a great meal, beginning with a libation, so liquids being poured out, cleansing with incense and salt water, and the opening of the mouth, in which the deceased's ability to partake of nourishment was ritually restored. In the insignia ritual, items of dress and regalia were offered to a statue of the deceased, which was then presented to the gods in a procession. The two rituals generally end with a common formal reversion of offerings to the deceased and the smashing of ritual vessels. A subset of the personal spells is directed against inimical forces, particularly snakes and worms, that could harm the deceased body or even the contents of the tomb. In the pyramid, such spells could appear on the east wall of the antechamber, above the small concealed chamber in an Egyptian tomb that houses the statue of the deceased, known as the Serdab. In the Pyramid of Unis, they are also inscribed on the west wall of the burial chamber above the sarcophagus. The pyramid texts are largely concerned with the deceased's relationship to two gods, Osiris and the sun. The sun was the original and daily source of all life. His appearance at the creation and at every sunrise thereafter made life possible in the world. Ruling over the universe by day, the sun was identified with Horus, the god of kingship, and at sunset he was seen as Atom, the oldest of all gods. The sun's daily movement through the sky was viewed as a journey from birth to death, and his rebirth at dawn was made possible through Osiris, the force of new life. The ancient Egyptians believed that each human consisted of three basic parts, of course, the physical body, and two non-material elements known as the Ka and the Ba. The Ka is an individual's life force. It's the element that makes the difference between a living body and a dead one. Each person's Ka ultimately came from the creator and returned to the gods at death. And the Ba 
is really kind of comparable to the Western notion of the soul or personality. It's the feature that makes each person unique, individual, and really separates them from everybody else. At death, the ka is separated from the body. In order for an individual to survive as a spirit in the afterlife here, the ba has to be reunited with its ka, which is its life force. If the ba could not reunite with its ka, it continues to exist in the afterlife, but wasn't really considered to be alive any longer. In contrast to the ox, such beings were regarded as the dead. You were alive, but you weren't fully there. The function of the pyramid text, in common with all ancient Egyptian funerary literature, was to enable the deceased Ba to reunite with its Ka and to become an Ak. And these texts are beautiful and truly incredible. It's so fascinating because while you view them as a guide to the afterlife for the deceased, it also allowed for the living to see that the soul of the deceased individual, who may have been somebody that they knew or loved, they were able to actually know that the soul of those that passed on, made it safely to the afterlife. And yes, we will be seeing the Pyramid of Unis, of course, in September and April. And the pyramid texts are absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. But what happens if we don't die during the Old Kingdom or the later part of the Old Kingdom or even during the First Intermediate Period? What if we're living a bit after 2180-ish BCE? What happens when we die? Would we get pyramid texts? No we would get something else. In fact, we would likely have had spells that belonged to the coffin texts. And the coffin texts were in use from the first intermediate period through the Middle Kingdom and are made up of almost 1,200 spells, incantations, and other forms of religious writing that were inscribed on coffins to help the deceased navigate the afterlife. They were used by a wide range of Egyptian society for private burials, Royal pyramid burials during this pyramid did not include mortuary texts inscribed on their walls. Nay, nay, we were getting coffin texts. And these texts include the text known as the Book of Two Ways. This Book of Two Ways was not even really a book, but a detailed map which corresponded to the rest of the text painted inside the coffin. They provided maps of the afterlife and the best way to avoid danger on one's way to paradise. These texts were derived in part from the earlier pyramid texts and would later inspire the work known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The coffin texts are significant on a number of levels, but primarily because they illustrate the cultural and religious shift between the Old Kingdom and the First Intermediate Period of Egypt and clarify the development of religious beliefs of the people. The coffin texts and spells and incantations reference many gods, most notably being Amun-Ra, Shu, Tefnut, and Thoth. But they do draw on the Osiris myth consistently. Spell 74, which is a spell for the revival of Osiris, recreates the part of the story in which Isis and his sister Nephthys bring him back to life. The coffin texts were usually painted in closely spaced columns. The texts were initiated by the term, which is usually translated as recitation or words to be spoken emphasizing their primary purpose as utterances meant to be spoken aloud rather than simply read. These texts were highly individualized in terms of which spells were actually selected for the deceased. And this selection varied from coffin to coffin. And there are around 100 coffins with these texts that are known, and each one is quite different. They've mainly been discovered in elite cemeteries in Middle Egypt, such as Deir el Bersha and Beni Hassan where the powerful nomarchs cut elaborate tombs into the cliffs for themselves and for their families. Compared to the pyramid texts, these new spells and incantations included the transformation spells to help the deceased change into a bird by which they would ascend into the sky or transforming into various forms, including certain deities. Another new motif was an express desire to reunite with family and loved ones in the afterlife, something I think many of us today still hope for. Apophis, the giant chaos serpent, who endangered the course of the sun god's nocturnal journey through the underworld each and every night, who had to be defeated each and every night, makes his first appearance in the coffin text and these spells. And within the coffin text, Osiris and the merging of the deceased with this god 
increases in importance as well. Where the pyramid texts were unillustrated, the coffin texts were a few spells accompanied by illustrations that were considered an integral part of the spell. So pyramid text, if you're trying to break it apart, going to be a lot more writing. Coffin text, a small amount of writing and more illustrations because it's almost maps and you're going for like a literal visual guide of how to get into the afterlife. So the maps from the Book of the Two Ways are often painted on the interior bottom of the coffins, and they provide guides for two possible routes, by land and by water, through the dangerous realm of the netherworld, with accompanying spells intended to aid the deceased in overcoming obstacles and getting past the dangerous guardians that they would encounter on this path. If successful in their endeavor, the deceased would enter an eternal paradise. The coffin texts were developed to meet the need of a new understanding of the afterlife and now the common people's place within it. During the Old Kingdom, only the king was guaranteed continued existence in the next world. Beginning during the First Intermediate Period, however, ordinary individuals were now thought just as worthy of an eternal life as those from the royal household. And of course, the illustrations within the coffin text are beautiful. These maps are truly almost otherworldly in a sense. But of course, now we've come to the long-awaited Book of the Dead. Yes, if we died anywhere from the New Kingdom on to basically almost Roman Egypt, like around 50 BCE, I believe, we would have used the Book of the Dead to help us get into the afterlife. Now, of course, the Book of the Dead is a modern term for this collection of magical spells that the Egyptians used. They imagined the afterlife as a kind of journey you had to make to get into paradise, like we saw with the coffin text. But this journey was quite hazardous, so you needed magical help along the way. And the Book of the Dead isn't a finite text. It's not like the Bible or other religious texts. It's not a collection of of a doctrine or a statement of faith or really anything like that. It's more of a practical guide to the next world, a how-to book, really, with spells that would help you on your journey. This book, quote-unquote, I'm using air quotes, is usually a roll of papyrus with lots and lots of spells written on it in hieroglyphic script. Some of the spells are to make sure that you can control your own body after death. The ancient Egyptians believed that a person was made up of different elements. The body, the spirit, their name, their heart, all of these are embodiments of a person. And the ancient Egyptians were afraid that these elements would disperse when you died. So there are a lot of spells to make sure that you don't lose your head or your heart so that your body doesn't decay, as well as other spells keeping you alive by breathing air, having water to drink, and having food to eat, having enough sustenance in the afterlife. There are also spells about protecting yourself because the ancient Egyptians expected to be attacked on the journey to the afterlife by snakes, crocodiles, insects, an idea very much based on the threats they knew in real life, only much more frightening and much more dangerous this time around. As well as animals trying to hunt you down on your way to the afterlife, you could be attacked by gods or demons who served the gods. In the next world, there are a lot of gods who are guarding gateways that you have to get through. And if you don't have the right answers to their questions at the gates when they ask you, they can attack you because they're holding knives and snakes in their hands and you are just utterly defenseless. Without the correct spells to protect you or to give you the correct answers, you could be punished in a variety of ways. You could be put on to the slaughter block, you could be decapitated, or you could be turned upside down, which doesn't sound bad. Okay, you get hung upside down. But to the ancient Egyptians, this meant that your digestive process worked in reverse. So you, therefore, would have to eat feces and drink urine forever if you were turned upside down in death, which, yeah, hanging upside down in death, don't put me down for that. But the worst thing that could happen was what was called the second death. This meant that you were killed and your spirit couldn't come back. So you would have no afterlife at all. It was a world of great fear that they believed that they were going into. But the Book of the Dead provided guidance and protection on their journey. The chapters or book of Going Forth by Day is actually the official translation of the title given to the collection of papyrus rolls 
on the same subject, which we commonly refer to as the Book of the Dead. Sometimes you might hear people saying it is the Book of Going Forth by Day or the Chapters of Going Forth by Day, but it's really what we call the Book of the Dead. Each was prepared by scribes for burials with varying quality, depending on, of course, the scribe's skill, and some were actually prepared with blank spaces to later fill in the name of the deceased individual, so you could kind of get them like pre-made. In addition to the long-form papyrus versions of the Book of the Dead, spells and passages from the text were recorded on other places, such as tomb walls, mummy wrappings, and even inside King Tut's golden mask. And of course, the gods such as Osiris, who is heavily associated with resurrection, and Ra, heavily associated with the sun as a sun god, star in the Book of the Dead. 42 additional gods appear to judge and test the newly deceased. Although the text itself varies in content and order, the narrative is generally divided into four main sections. The deceased enters the underworld and regains the physical abilities of the living. The deceased then is resurrected and joins Ra to rise as the sun each and every day. The deceased travels across the sky before the judgment in the underworld by a panel of gods, which is going to be the weighing of the heart ceremony, which we all know and love. And then finally, assuming that your soul has not been destroyed, the deceased joins the gods. And you might be wondering, what do you mean your soul is destroyed? Well, this is the second death I was mentioning earlier. Yes. In order to be with the gods, you have to pass a pretty steep, I would say, pass-fail system. So what that means is your heart is actually weighed against the feather of truth or the feather of ma'at. So in many times, in many of the artworks, you will actually see Anubis placing the heart on the other scale with the feather in the other. And everybody who is deceased, you are keeping fingers and toes crossed that your heart weighs less than the feather of truth. Why? Because a crocodile-headed goddess, Amit, is sitting at the other side of the scale and she's waiting for her midday snack. Yes, if your heart weighs less than the feather of truth. Anubis lets Osiris know, and you are able to go forth in your journey to the afterlife. But let's say you weren't the greatest person. You were kind of a dick. Well, your heart might weigh more than the feather of truth. And what happens if your heart weighs more? Well, the scale is going to showcase that. And at that point, Amit is going to consume your heart. And that is where your journey into the afterlife ends. That is where your soul is destroyed. That is second death, which why I said earlier, it's a very steep pass fail. <laughs> but of course, if your heart didn't get eaten, you would join the gods in the afterlife. And these texts were certainly important to the ancient Egyptians, of course. And now they constitute one of the most important resources for Egyptologists hoping to understand the Egyptian religion and their afterlife. The Book of the Dead reveals central aspects of the ancient Egyptians' belief system. And like many topics in Egyptology, our theories are constantly changing, growing, and adapting with every new translation of this text. And that, my friends, are the three main funerary texts of ancient Egypt. With the pyramid text spanning back to the Old Kingdom, all the way with the Book of the Dead going to 50 BCE, at the end of the Ptolemaic rule in Egypt. That's literally like over 2,000 years of funerary text that we just covered. <laughs> it's a lot, but it's so incredible to, to understand and realize, you know, why were these so important? They needed almost a handbook, a guide for the recently deceased to be able to make it to that next life. Many people today will have books from their own religions really mapping out, you know, burial practices. What do you have to do? Um, how do you have to act? to make sure that you get to whatever afterlife you believe in. And the ancient Egyptians, not so different from us today with that. But with that being said, that is going to be where I leave you guys off on funerary texts of ancient Egypt. For now, we will probably come back and touch on this topic later. We still have to discuss mummification. We have so much more to, to discuss in the realm of funerary concepts and topics with the ancient Egyptians. But as always, on my off weeks of Dirt Diaries, you can catch me on Sticks and Bones podcast where I'm talking about ancient magic, superstition, Greek and Roman mythology, and so much more. 
And for the next podcast, well, I am taking a little bit of a break. Why? Because I'm going to be in Egypt. So there will be no podcast after this one. So where the next podcast was supposed to drop on September 4th, well, set your alarms because the next one is not going to come out until September 18th. And I will be back from Egypt and I will be back on the Dirt Diaries. And we will be talking about ancient makeup and cosmetics because, man, the ancients knew a thing or two about winged eyeliner. But as always, if you want more content from me, you can catch me on Patreon with more content. I'm still actually going to be posting on Patreon during this little vacation break that I'm taking with uh, the next episode off. So if you want to see more of Dirt Diaries, you can catch me there. Don't forget to check out the new Egypt trip for April of next year. And as always, stay curious, keep your books open, and I will see you guys next time on The Dirt Diaries.